Accessing library computer data. Out there, there are no saints. Just people. Hey everybody, welcome back to the show. We're continuing our run through of Star Trek Deep Space Nine. Right now we're up to the episode called The Siege of AR-558. The eighth episode of the seventh season aired on November 18th, 1998, written by Ira Stephen Bear and Hans Beamler, directed by Weinrich Colby. In this episode, during a supply run to AR-558, Cisco finds the defending Starfleet unit with over two-thirds of the troops dead and the remaining soldiers' morale extremely low. When the Defiant comes under attack, Cisco, Bashir, Dax, Nog, and Quark choose to remain on the planet, which is about to come under attack by a much larger contingent of Jem'Hadar soldiers. We're here with Clay. Clay, how are you? I'm good. Um, my favorite thing in this episode is at the very beginning when Bashir comes in and thanks Vic Fontaine for finding the time to put those CDs, put those, that music on that little stick. Yeah. Cause it, it, it's, it's like, it's like if I tried to burn a CD on my computer and my computer is like, yes, when I have time, come back in three days. Hey, hey, what's he called? He calls him Polly or something like that. He's like, hey, <laughs> hey, buddy, how's it go? What do you, um, what do you think of Vic Fontaine? I can Fontaine? do that for you, but I'm very busy. I'm very extremely busy right now. What do you what do you think of uh Vic is kind of a head fake to this episode because his sure. his um presence has nothing to do with anything and it's a totally different tone. Uh, I guess leading into whatever uh comes next in the episode which we'll get to, but what what are your thoughts on Vic Fontaine? Um I've heard a lot of people who really like him, but what what do you think? He's fine. Um they don't really use him for much. He's just sort of there to be that character. I mean, he's just kind of a background player. Like even this, even this episode, he's pretty superfluous. Yes, um, yeah. And I mean, that's fine. You know, I guess it's. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't really have much of an opinion. I think he's fun. I guess, but it's not like I don't look forward to seeing him or anything. Yeah, I feel. Um, I feel he's a little bit odd of a character to have yeah. like he's um especially this late into the show right have yeah, that yeah. So that that character really feels like a first season character that never really clicks right you know? and then they get rid of him after a couple of years and they're like or yeah. just forget to write him into scripts anymore i i mean he's clearly just ira stephen bear's love of that kind of music of like lounge mm-hmm. jazz sort of brought to life and I guess he's he's all right. He's not distracting enough where I ever don't appreciate him. And I like the performance and everything like that. It's just it does feel weird to have characters in real life walking into the holodeck to to have him do things for them. Yeah, like that's it's yeah. a strange holodeck twist, I guess. But and it it's it's strange because especially this one, it 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 makes it feel like this holodeck program is constantly running. Right. Yeah. You know, no one else it's can not, use it. Yeah, like I don't know who started, who reserved this hall suite, and who put this program in. I guess Rom, but also Bashir showed up to pick up that CD that he burned for him. Mm-hmm. So it, it's a Bashir it feels thing, like right? it's, I think it's a Bashir thing when they when they show him. I think it's Bashir showing the group how great his new program is. So I think he's right. Bashir's product. Yeah, and it just feels like they the way that they handle it here. It feels like it's just constantly running because people can walk in and out, and it's just going. Right, right. No privacy, I guess. But let's uh, let's take a break. We're going to play an audio clip, and then we'll come back and we'll break down the siege of AR-558. Let me tell you something about humans, nephew. They're a wonderful, friendly people. As long as their bellies are full and their horror suites are working. But take away their creature comforts. Deprive them of food. Sleep, sonic showers. But their lives in jeopardy over an extended period of time. And those same friendly, intelligent, wonderful people will become as nasty and as violent as the most bloodthirsty Klingon. And the uh, the Vic Fontaine stuff is clearly not what the episode is about because mm. they quickly drop that and they I move... Do- I did want to say my one other thing that I did enjoy is that at least someone finally acknowledged how old the music is, yeah. and it was him specifically. <laughs> and he's like, "Who wants to listen to this? It's four hundred years old." <laughs> and I think uh, B 
Bashir gives him the the right compliment though. He's like, but you'll bring it to life in a different uh, yeah. vein or something yes. like that, mm-hmm. which is what every singer, every crooner wants to hear, I think. But yeah, it quickly um quickly turns into a very dark, devastating, psychologically uh, affecting episode of Star Trek Deep Space Nine, I think. It moves fully into Dominion War territory in a lot of ways that some of the best episodes of the later seasons have done. And I think it's all the better for it that they do that. Uh, so what did you think of Siege of AR-558? Um, I liked it a lot. It still felt slightly redundant to me. Um, but I think the plus side is they're very good at these episodes. So it didn't bother me as much as some of the other more redundant episodes have. It, like This one didn't feel like they were running out of stories or anything. Uh, but it did feel like ground they've covered previously, whether it's Nog, Nog's hero worship, which I guess you could just call a character trait, but they had a whole episode where it supposedly was trying to break him of that habit. Mm-hmm. Um, or just the uh, st- marooned on a marooned on a planet facing down uh, a bunch of Jem'Hadar with uh, lacking supplies. You know, they, they've done that before. Um, I actually thought the thing that, really made this different and i can't believe that i i'm saying this is the inclusion of quark Mm -hmm. (laughs) because at first i was just you know rolling my eyes so hard i could see the back of my head um when he was showed up and he was like oh grand nagus but at first i thought this was going to be a ferengi episode and i was not excited um but when he gets down there and he starts uh, being the voice of the other side, the other point of view of the Federation and of humans, I thought that stuff was really interesting. Yeah. And especially talking to Nog, because Nog has that level of hero worship, uh, and Quark is kind of trying to pull him back to the other side. Not necessarily ground him, because the stuff that he's saying is pretty equally as uh, uh, inflammatory. Um, not necessarily wrong, but he's not. he's not exactly riding the line you know yeah yeah um it's a callback yeah, to thought- uh and if you remember all the way back in the second season the Jemadar, where the Jemadar introduced quark plays a, a similar role it's where him and cisco go camping with the boys and oh yes quark yeah. has a similar perspective at that point he and cisco have a similar conversation about why humans and ferengi don't see eye to eye it's it's not exactly the same situation here because here it's it's about dying in battle and they, they aren't aware of that fact of that episode but it's, it's a similar thing and it's a trait that we both kind of liked where Quark serves as a having like a realistic point of view about things mm-hmm. where he's not a mm-hmm. goofy, corny Ferengi point of view. They 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 take the Ferengi point of view and they just make it more of a believable, um, like a believable selfishness, I, I suppose, would be the way to look at it, where he he's voicing the selfishness of wanting people to stay alive that he knows and like not thinking that the, the risk is worth it and I I, th- I think that he's sort of vital to it, and it's a role that I wish Quark played more often in the series. But yeah. when he does it, it's it's effective. Yeah, um, I like that he isn't. Uh, he's not trying to um, present a sort of middle of the road viewpoint either, where it's not like there's there's no like uh, uh, pull back at the end of his statement where it's like humans are. They seem nice, but as soon as they, you know, are backed into a corner, they they're more monstrous than even the most dangerous Klingon. He doesn't pull back and be like, you know, but these humans are 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 good people or something like that. Right. He's just like, nope, doesn't moderate flat it. out. Yeah, um, although his yeah, I, his ending is a subtle reversal of his opinion there, right? Where he mm-hmm. he protects uh, Nog. At the very end. And he does what he was saying Nog should not do the entire time. And they do it without dialogue, which is subtle for Star Trek. They don't have mm. Quark go, you know, you changed my mind. I'm going to stand here and protect you. <laughs> they do it entirely through visual context and him yeah. just shooting the Jem'Hadar soldier at the very end. And that's nice when Star Trek does things like that. And it avoids the very 90s trope of like, now I'm going to explain to the idiot audience why he did that. Um, but I... I, I think that's why I, I really like this episode is because, well, I do think it's somewhat redundant in content. I think the perspective is different here because yeah, yeah. Ro- I think it's most similar to Rocks and Shoals, but Rocks and Shoals is all about knowing the enemy's point of view 
and the moral quandary that comes from knowing what the Vorta is trying to do in that episode. Right. This, the Jem'Hadar don't have a personality. The Dominion don't have a personality in this. They're just a force right. of like zombies that are coming mm-hmm. for people. And so it's purely how our Star Trek characters are feeling about this situation. And uh, just to get it out of the way, I think this is maybe one of the greatest directed episodes of Star Trek that's ever been done. It's like, mm. I, I love the sound design. I love the way it looks. They're basically on a cave set that's maybe like 15 feet by 15 feet the entire time. But it mm-hmm. never looks old and it never looks silly. And they're really effective right. at just like shooting on this set. There's a lot of weird camera angles in it. The sound effects are really great. They have like crickets in the background, like space crickets, <laughs> which is really strange. And the battle scene is maybe the best battle scene, like hand-to-hand combat that any of the shows have ever done to this yeah. point. Yeah, by far. That, 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 uh, that final battle was, was really well done. Especially given what you're saying, where it's not a lot of room, it's not a lot of people, but they make it look fairly, fairly epic. Yeah. My 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 one problem is actually the um the scale of things are, is kind of weird in this, where it's a hundred people is, yeah. guarding a planet apparently, and the Dominion have a hard time taking it back for some yeah. reason. Yeah. Uh, but w- once you get around that, I think that's really my only like technical nitpick, uh, which is purely production based, it seems. But it, it's wonky that they are the Dominion. If this place is so important to them, they don't just bombard them with soldiers to take it back. Right. Yeah. It, like the, uh, they, they kind of, they, they set it up so it, it, it feels a little less awkward, but it, it's, once you start thinking about it, it, it's still kind of weird where it's like, they, they, there's only, in order for them to get point to, to, to us from their base, they have to go through this valley, specific valley that is uh, got mountains on either side of it. And based on the the scale of what's hap- happening here, the valley is like thirty five feet wide. Yeah, yep. You know, it, it's and and they finally and also it's the future, and they're still sending guys on foot to do hand to hand combat. They've got lasers. Yeah, <laughs> they've got they, they've got still shooting torpedoes. at each other. Yeah, they- <laughs> yeah, they've got lasers and torpedoes, and they're still shooting at each other from like five feet away. Are they are they in the cave? I think they're in a cave or something, right? Which is maybe a little bit of uh, something, but it's still it's sort a- of. I, I'm not even totally sure. Like part of it's a cave, but it, I thought the 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 last stand was sort of like outside it. But mm-hmm. whatever, it, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Yeah, it's, I think the point still stands that if the Dominion thought this was so important that, that they were upset that Starfleet was getting access to their communications relay, just blow the planet to shit, basically, would be yeah. my solution. Yeah, you could have thrown in a line about it being too valuable of a, a piece of thing product, to yeah. completely yeah. destroy or something, so they need to do it on foot, but whatever, it doesn't matter. It doesn't. That's that's my only nitpick, because I really like this one. I think that it's... um. It's maybe the darkest hour of Star Trek DS9 in a lot of ways. I think it's even darker than Pale Moonlight. Um, I think that the emotions of it are handled a little bit better than Pale Moonlight, where Pale Moonlight felt a little bit theatrical to me. And I think that this Mm -hmm. feels more cinematic and believable, all the way down to like quirks, not saying what's going on, but you just have to interpret what is sort of thing as Nog losing his leg, um, which is... Which is really like in modern TV, Nog would die in this episode. I think a lot of people might die in this episode if it was sort of mm-hmm. a, a modern TV series that was halfway through its final season. Um, but outside of that, I think it's really, I think it's really great, and I think it's really emotional. And it's got so many good scenes in it. I think where Worf is talking to Cisco at the very end uh, mm-hmm. about like how glorious of a victory it was. Yeah, I, I don't know. What, what do you want to say about it? Um. Yeah. I. Uh... I I, th- I think I'm on the same page with you. Um, yeah, I I I, keep, I just keep thinking about all the quark stuff. That stuff worked. It that stuff worked really well, and also like the store the soldier to soldier story stuff. I thought worked a lot better than I thought. Good guest stars like the, in this. Who yeah. they veer? They could have veered, and maybe they do veer a little close to like uh, tropey, silly eighty action star. Uh, soldiers, but I think that, that one guy does. Yeah, the with guy with the the, uh, the Jemadar yeah. necklace, the catch yourself white ne- or Tuco. Are you talking about from uh, Breaking Bad? The guy with the necklace. The guy yeah, with the necklace. I yeah. thought Tuco was good. I thought you know he's that guy. I'm surprised that that guy is not in more stuff because he's always good. He does. Um, he brings um he brings the uh he he brings the intensity. I guess would be a way to describe yeah. him. I, I think all the soldiers are good. I think that they. Well, I I think the setup is really 
cool because it's you're so used to the Star Trek episodes where everyone beams down and everyone they meet are the Star Trek professionals. And they do a yes. good job here of being like, you know, it's been five months of like continuous yeah. assault and we like everyone is grumpy with each other. People are yelling at each other. It's all it's all falling apart at the seams and our characters walk into that situation at that point. Yeah, that this is the kind of um Dominion War episode that I was waiting for. Something where it's it's not explicitly like grand movements of, of each party where it's like, you know, Wei Yun and Damar coordinating the taking of an entire planet or something, you know, it, it, where with a uh, one of those 35 ship shots, yeah, you know, whatever. Crashing it's, into it's a, each other. It's a yeah. small story about how the war is affecting soldiers on a personal basis and, uh, you know, taking... I I really liked I really liked Cisco's arc in this going from uh talking about the names on the board and how he used to read all the names but now there's just too many of them to actually putting him down there with the people who are actually dying and giving him a new perspective on that and uh and then having him come out the other side as someone who's has obviously a newfound respect for all these people who are getting killed. Yeah. They're not they're um, not just names by the end of the episode yeah. anymore and uh he owes it to them to remember them for what they are. O- oddly yeah. oddly telling that to Kira who seems like the wrong character to tell yeah, that. Yeah, I know. To. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> of all the people to tell that to, she's not the one. I, I think it should have bookended with Odo because Odo is in the beginning and I I think that it makes sense for that conversation to continue with Odo, but it's it's strange that they include Kira as the person he explains I, that to. I would also argue that it might be make sense to have Worf have that conversation because Worf, even though he's grown from just a hipster Klingon, he still has that hipster Klingon aspect to him where he could be the one who's saying like, oh, it was a victory for the victory for the ages. They'll write songs about this and it, I, I and focus on the victory more than the, peop- the people who are killed and, right. and yeah. have that as an opportunity for Cisco to be like, listen, it's not about, it's not about the victory. It's, you know, we can't forget the people who have made it happen, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. I, I, I wonder, I, I guess my problem with, if it was war receiving that is that the Klingons tend to revere the dead. Like they, they tend sure. to really, they, they find honor in the sacrifice of dying. So I feel like Worf wouldn't be skimming over the, the people in that way. I think that true. Yeah. I, I don't know who it would be. I, I don't know if it's like maybe an admiral or something would make more sense there. Someone, some sort of like uh, bean counter who comes in and is telling Cisco about this, and he sort of like snaps at them about it. But I, I think it's fine. It's a really minor nitpick that is Kira, but it's, it is a good arc for him. And I think that Cisco gets a lot of um, interesting pushback from Quark in particular, and a lot of other people about like him saying like it, you wouldn't send uh, Nog out there if Nog was Jake, and Jake is not a Starfleet officer as his mm-hmm. comeback. But it's certainly sets him up and it's another subtle thing of he checks in on nog during the end of it he doesn't complain about being sad about it or anything he he continues to do his captain uh of starfleet routine but he does check in on nog and talks to quark about it and you can just see that it's um it's something that affected him obviously even though it's only nog losing his leg instead of his life but it is what it is what if it was vic fontaine that he had the conversation (laughs) with and vic was like man Sounds like it got pretty wild out there. You know, I was going to join up and go into the service, but my knee's weird, so they wouldn't let me in. <laughs> Bone spurs. So I'd just stay here and comfort everyone's wife. I, he's like, let me tell you, Pally, about uh, this hard, uh, t- the trumpet player completely out off key this entire night. Yeah. It, was a, it, was a real, it was a real siege of my I knee. was in the service, spent my whole, <laughs> spent the entire war in France singing songs for the locals. <laughs> You give me fever. Um, I tell you, I've never seen a front line as hairy as the front line of the of the queue to get into the show that I was playing <laughs> that night. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, I, I think there's just a, a decent amount going on in here. The Dex uh, thing with her engineer is fine. It it, it suffers a little bit from engineer that. Uh, is the kid from Lost in Space, by the way. Oh, is he? Interesting. Yeah, the original Lost in Space. Yeah, oh, he's he's still out there, I guess, doing work. Still out there. Yep. <laughs> I yeah, guess we know how that show ended. He signed up for Starfleet and was killed in battle. 
I I think maybe the biggest thing that drew me out of this is that the only people who die are the people that are down there from the start. Like, they're all the characters who don't need to return to the show, uh, getting shot and mm. killed at the very end. What did you think of um, Cisco getting knocked down and then waking up with the battle one? I thought that was strange that they never even included an explanation of how things turned around. You're just supposed to assume right as Cisco is in the crosshairs of this Jem Hadar that everything turned out all right. Yeah, it was fine. It yeah. reminded me of uh, before they had their money to do this stuff on a large scale. Uh, the first big battle in Game of Thrones, they do the whole thing from um, Tyrion's perspective, and he gets knocked out like right. 10 minutes right. into it, and then he wakes <laughs> yeah. up. He wakes up, and everything's just destroyed, and they're like, what happened? You were asleep the whole time. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it is reminiscent uh, of that. It's a, it's a great budget saver, I guess. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. And it, I thought it was fine. Um, you know, I, I, I don't think you need a big explanation as to how they ended up winning it's just that's how it shook out you know yep yep they held they held it was their only their, their order i think it's um it's neat that like you were saying it's a, the the dominion war episode that you kind of feel has been missing for a while like yeah the dominion war comes in and it uh makes such brief appearances every once in a while that you never really feel the impact of what the war means for the people who are fighting it like you, you never really see any sort of psychological ramifications of any of the stuff it's usually a space battle and they take a planet or it's dealing with some kind of dominion subterfuge or something like that and i think it was important that they do this and i think it, the episode itself almost kind of feels like a turning point in the war to me because it doesn't feel like they can go much lower than that it, it feels like on even on a small scale this represents like the it, it almost feels like if, if the Dominion had broken through this front, that almost feels like it's the end of the Dominion War for Starfleet on some level. Mm-hmm. Like, it feels vital that they hold this at this point. And I really like that about it, it, that it feels like it's this really important turning point in the war, even though it's such a small stakes issue that they're dealing with. And I think that it's um, it's nice to have that release from the war because they don't touch on it all that often when they do, I think they have to do it well and they end up usually doing it well as they do here. Yeah. It's, it's nice. It's nice to have something that's more than just someone offhandedly mentioning that the dominion are still out there yeah. or, or, uh, Beta Zed is captured. Dealing, yeah. Dealing with something silly, uh, where it's like, Oh, Jake has a- accidentally released a very sexy robot, but uh, we have to deal with this, but also remember that there's a war happening. Mm hmm. It's um because I, I think they've been hitting this theme fairly reliably, which is that um like the the Star Trek ethos is always going to kind of run into a problem of even if it hasn't been it's not a pacifist show or anything like that. Like I don't think any of the series have ever been totally pacifist, but Quark kind of represents a form of pacifism here, where he's like, none of this is worth it. I would just crack a deal with them, no matter what the terms are, just so that we don't have I- to live through this. Yeah, I think you. I I think it depend. I don't know if I would necessarily call it pacifism because it's maybe it, maybe I I don't think he has an aversion to war. I think he's just uh, it's it's a it's about the bottom line still. You mm-hmm. know, um, it's not war is good for the bottom line. As, as I think the Ferengi have a rule of acquisition about war is good for business or something like that too. That yeah. they mentioned, yeah. But it's like it's it's. I don't think for him it's about saving lo- saving everybody's life as much as it is saving his own life. Mm-hmm. Uh, and if you can do that by making a deal, then that that's great. And I act- I really did like that scene when when he's um, talking to getting Nog. into yeah talking to Nog and and getting into it and saying what the Ferengi would do and how they would oh they would have cracked they would have made a deal long ago and none of this would have happened because it doesn't yeah it doesn't feel like it's it doesn't feel like he's doing that because it's the moral or right thing to do. It's just um, uh, how how to how to most profit from the situation or or lose the least at, at least. Yeah, yeah. Because I, I I think that um, we don't really praise them a lot, but I think that it's I think that that scene where Quark is talking to Nog is maybe one of the best performed scenes that the show has ever done it's with two Mm -hmm. fairly ridiculous characters like the frangie are fairly ridiculous uh these two do a good job with them but they take this sort of cornball race and they 
make them feel real and effective. And I think that it's a, it's an important Nog episode at the same time too, because he is fully sort of turning his back on uh, Quark and the Ferengi ways and everything. And the source mm-hmm. of their conflict is the fact that he wants to be seen as a hero in the Starfleet uh, view of things. And I don't know. I think it's really like subtle. They're not like squawking like Ferengi usually do. Like it, it's a very right. nuanced conversation about what Quark wants and what Nog wants and the, uh, the conflict that they both have about it. And like, it makes total sense in context. I, I just think the scripting there and the performances are really strong from both of them. And I think that they do a, a really effective job of portraying that moment in time for them. Yeah. And it, it is kind of a, they use Quark to really deliver one of the more damning reads on Starfleet. I think that they've had up to this point uh, where he says like, this isn't the Starfleet, you know, and then he gets into the human thing. It 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 very much feels like it is, it is it is a well written speech from someone who is dealing with the Federation because they have to, not because they necessarily like them yep. or think that they're good. And I think it's it's a very subtle. It's very. It, oh, I even I even read it as um, I read it as Quark seeing the ugly side of humanity that Star Trek is kind of loath to admit still exists at that right, point. Yeah. Right. That's, that's, that's what I mean by, by it being an indictment of Starfleet. I mean like a metatextual indictment of yeah, Starfleet, yeah. but, uh, but on top of the idea that even though, you know, having him say, this isn't the Starfleet, you know, is a little on the nose, but I think it's really subtly well-written because of who it's coming from. And it feels like it's a really honest thing for him to say uh without being without without him straight up coming out and being like the only reason I deal with them is because I have to, not because I like them. Right. You know? Yeah. They they have him say all that stuff and you can really infer from it that that's what his position is. It's 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 it the the thing that surprised me the most about this episode is how much of that st- how well written that stuff was. Because I feel like episodes like this for most shows the minute you have a soldier who's been, you know, you've got a character who's a soldier who's been stuck here for five months and you give him, like, a page of dialogue, that dialogue's going to be pretty hokey and it's not necessarily going to land as emotionally as you think it's going to. Um, but I thought all of those scenes were, were really good. I thought the stuff that the the Quark uh, stuff was great. I thought the stuff, the story that Tuco tells. Yeah, I that, don't know that's, if, that's if, very good. Tuco's story, yeah. Yeah, I don't know if if it's if it's him acting the shit out of it or if it's legitimately well written or if it's a combination of both well it's another um, it's another thing of the writing is better there because he doesn't end that speech with and now i feel terrible because he's dead like it, it yeah. you know it it just lets you fill in the blanks in a way that's really mature and sometimes star trek doesn't do that Some, sometimes star trek is like you must get the point i'm going to tell you what the point is yeah and i thought bashir had a lot of great stuff. Well, he didn't have a lot of great stuff, but the stuff he did have was good. Um, He's more of a reactionary character uh, to everything in this, and uh, like he he re- he's reacting to Dax and he's reacting to Tuco and everything. But he, I think right. he handles the Tuco scene really well, uh, like as an actor, like the the acting of that role where Tuco pulls the gun on him. Uh, I think Bashir mm-hmm. handles that really interestingly as a character where he. He felt like he's come a long way from first season Bashir, who wouldn't handle that so calmly and things right. like that. So it's nice well, to see that the that, war has changed him a little bit. He's got that great line later when he, they're all setting up on the line. And, and I think it's Tuco says something about, well, maybe he doesn't say, I can't remember if he says something or if he, if Bashir volunteers it himself about getting into this for saving lives. Oh, yeah, because uh, Tuco's like, you look like you've done this before. And he's like, yeah, unfortunately, I have. Yeah. And I yeah. thought th- I thought that was, you know, it was it was a little bit, It was, but I thought it was nice. I thought it was well done. Cisco had a lot of great stuff, too. Um, I can't remember it specifically, but he had some, some good small speeches that I thought were, they felt of a piece to this kind of story, but they didn't feel, you know, hacky. Yeah, you know, it, it was because I, you know, I'm in the middle of writing bloody hell right now, so I, I was, I was, my ears were kind of open for this kind of dialogue because I was like, I'm trying to, I'm, I, I, I'm trying to have dialogue in this war comic, but I don't want it to come off as really lame. So I, I'm trying to pay attention to what they're doing and seeing if it's working or not. And I wasn't expecting it to work, and it worked really well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's that's pretty good praise. I, I think that the um. I think I think all of their dialogue works because it's mostly underwritten. 
in an effective way where no one's yeah. no one's over talking about what they're doing. And I think that all of the characters have the 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 scene and the setup for it is so well executed that all of the characters feel extremely natural in how their reactions pan out from it. Like mm-hmm. Even Dax just talks about, like, I have all these memories of fear and knowing what fighting is about and everything like that, but it's still not equal to the real thing of being there. Like, there's you you can't empathize enough with the situation until you're actually in it, which is a really interesting right. take from Dax. Quark obviously has this thing about, like, the selfishness boils down to him turning the corner and sort of saving uh, Nog at the, at the very end, and he has a realization. Bashir's thing is, he is... He, he started that he became a doctor to save lives. And the only way to save lives is to kill people is his conflict in this. Like the, right. the only way out of this is to kill people who are threatening their lives. So they all have really believable problems. It's not one of those episodes where the B plot, you're like, why is this character doing this at this point? Like what's going on with that? I just think that the, the situation is so natural for all of them all of their writing and all their dialogue and all their choices, even if they don't have choices, all the things that they end up doing are really like, oh, that's that's like a perfect Bashir thing. Oh, that's a perfect Dax thing. Oh, that's a perfect Quark mm. thing. It's a perfect Cisco thing. And I think that's just to the uh, the script's credit. Yeah, the Dax stuff, too, I thought was the best use of her so far, um, putting her in that position where, she, yeah, she has she has no experience doing this, but her other hosts, or, uh, her uh, yeah, her other hosts did. Um, I thought that was interesting. That's not something that they, I don't feel like they really did that with Jedzia that often. No, not really. Um, and so it's a good, I thought it was a good use of her there. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it, I'm just happy that the B plot of this wasn't every couple minutes cutting back to Deep Space Nine to see how uh, Rom's audition was. <laughs> <laughs> He's typing up some charts too, uh, to handle that. Yeah. Yeah. Him and his uh, Lita are working on uh, you know a new a new song for the act. <laughs> with, gonna... with uh, Miles O'Brien on the bass. Everyone, Miles O'Brien. <laughs> <laughs> they, but they, Rom, this is ridiculous. I've got work to do. They even pay the uh, the Vic Fontaine stuff off fairly nicely and subtly. I think where Bashir plays the music during the final yes. sequence, which yeah. I think to me I interpret that as even more of the subtle of. Um, the Dominion are a force that threatens Starfleet's way of life. And as this battle for the future of whether Starfleet or the Federation exists anymore, they are celebrating their culture at that point. Like, they're, they're still... The, the music just kind of represents the, like, this is what we are, this is what we stand for, and this is what we're here to protect. And it's just a really nice callback to the, to, the start of, to the start of it. And it, it makes the whole thing mesh really nicely. Yeah, it's like when they play the Beastie Boys in Star Trek Beyond. Yes, exactly the same. It's ex- <laughs> it kind of is, actually. <laughs> or the um, what's the one that drives you nuts more about the Star Trek um, when he's in the on the motorcycle or something? Oh yeah, in the first one, yeah, yeah, the, the yeah. first the two thousand nine when he steals the car, the four hundred year old car. <laughs> and it's a, and listens and the, to the <laughs> listens to the. Uh, <laughs> 350 year old music it's the uh what's the, what song is it do you remember i can't remember the, uh sabotage sabotage but it's, it's, it's not the um, same it's the same one they use in the in the third movie the only the only acceptable song to listen to is uh red barquetta by rush i think and that's <laughs> <laughs> see i would appreciate it so much more if it was something like a less on the nose and if it was like here's young captain kirk he's stealing a car Tearing ass through the plains of Iowa, listening to uh, "Shaken" by Eddie Money. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a little. Uh, yeah, when it's when it's clearly like the music of the filmmaker or whatever, I think is is the problem that you, you run into there. I, although I guess uh, this is the same thing. Irish Stephen Bear loves crooners, so he's going to put some crooner music into. At it. least it makes sense in this context because there's a holodeck element, right. and it's not just you know it, if you. <laughs> That we can save this conversation for when we cover these movies, but it's 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 akin to me of someone stealing their stepdad's four hundred year old car, a, uh, and then blasting like Tchaikovsky or something, yeah, and feeling yeah. really rad about blasting Tchaikovsky. I don't know. Yep. Yeah. Let's. Uh, I guess we can. Um, Nog's thing would be the only the final beat to this. Oh yeah. Um. What'd you think about Nog losing his leg? Was was there? Anything? I thought it was great. Yeah, you liked it. Yeah, I I am. Uh, you know, I I know what you're saying about killing characters. 
<coughs> Excuse me. But we've ta- we've talked before how I feel like killing characters is uh, seems to be the only thing people understand in modern television as uh, how to hurt them. Like it's it's very rare that you have a character get hurt and then have to live with whatever has hurt them. It's more a lot more common for them to just be killed. Right. Um. So actually having a character get shot and then have his leg removed, which I'm sure next episode they're going to be like, oh, good, the amp- the uh, the cybernetic implant took and he's got a new leg again. Do yep. they do that? Yeah. Uh, no, well, they, they deal with it, actually. They have an episode okay, good. Bo- well, focused good. on it. Yeah. Oh. yeah, well, that's great then because I think that stuff is rare in a lot of these shows. Uh, like imagine if, imagine if halfway through the, the seventh season of, of, uh, of TNG – uh, Riker got his arm cut off, or something, you know, <laughs> and data just gives him one of his, uh, robot arms and he's walking around crushing yeah. things. Yeah. yeah. So I, I think it's, I think it's interesting. It, it, it they go out of their it, way to say that the implant isn't going to work on him. Bashir is very, yeah. very cavalier in uh, stating that, that he, his nerves are so shot that he cannot have a prosthetic that, uh, that would fit the 24th century of prosthetics, which you, you feel like losing a limb in that era probably isn't all that bad, but here it is apparently. Yeah, and I think that's more of, you know, a more effective way of bringing the war home than like killing Dax or something. You know what I mean? Yeah. Where it's yeah. like when you've got something like that, you can sort of sweep it under the rug, and uh, yeah, you can dip in on it when you need to. But it, it you, it's kind of a one and done situation. But if you've got someone who is irreparably changed, then you're always going to see the reminder of, of how things have changed and how people are getting hurt and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. I, I think they had to do something. I like, I like the choice here of having him lose his leg uh, because I think that they had to have some kind of ramification happen to one of our main or like major cast characters. Mm-hmm. You can't just have all of the people who were there first get shot and killed and then expect anything to kind of take away to last from it. But uh, right. I, I think that they, I think Aaron Eisenberg and Armin Shimmerman are both really good in this. I think that it's a nice Ferengi episode for them in terms of just being, uh, if it's about the Ferengi at all, I think that they both do a really good job. And I, um, Oh, sorry. No, that, go ahead. That, that, go ahead. I was just going to say, uh, I don't know why there aren't more Ferengi in Starfleet. Like, I don't know why they're not actively trying to recruit them, because I feel like their their listening ability would come in Quite handy, as it does here when <laughs> Quark gets the drop on that Jem Hadar because he can hear him coming. Yeah, or they just use you know? Nog as a tricorder because he can hear where the Jem Hadar are. Yep, exactly. Yeah, I mean, I guess the profit thing stands in the way. They don't get paid, so they're not uh, sure. Yeah. And they also they don't have that good. At, well, I guess it depends on how that you can attune your ears to certain sounds or whatever. But mm-hmm. I was going to say they're probably better used on the ground in an infantry capacity than like on a starship, but. They're smaller. They're like odd job in uh, 007. They're hard to shoot in the. Yes. <laughs> they're just below. They're constantly. Everybody. They're kneeling the entire time, running around <laughs> kneeling in in the the, the facility level of Goldeneye. It's that auto target pulls your uh, your cursor right into the middle of the screen. Odd job just pistols, goes right pistols on you. only. Yep, pistols only. Golden gun, one hit kill. Let's see. Uh, I think that's it. We're going to take a break. We're going to play an audio clip. Me and Clay will come back. We'll read some patron thoughts about the siege of AR five five eight. Captain. Yes, Mr. War. The USS Vera Cruz has entered orbit. They are beaming down troop replacements and an engineering crew. What about our people? Dr. Bashir is aboard the Vera Cruz with Nog and the rest of the wounded. They will be taken to a hospital on Starbase 371. Good. I'll return to the Defiant shortly. This was a great victory. One worthy of story and song. It cost enough. All right, everybody. So if you enjoyed the content today, you can support the show at patreon.com slash the Penske file. A couple dollars a month gets you extra stuff, extra podcasts, extra access to some videos and stuff that we do. All that good stuff. Uh, we're doing the Black Mirrors right now. You get to vote on Real Ripe and Real Rotten. There's a whole bunch of perks. So go to patreon.com slash the Penske file. And as always, our Captain Tier supporters get a shout out. Special thanks go to Andrew Sherlock. Ben Douglas, Captain Quark, Cardinal Doomsday, Christian Michaels, Christian Pouch, David Mo- uh, Darth Mosk, David Beardmore, David K, Dwayne Hackett, Eric Johnson, I.C. Unicorns, Yarpy, Joint Mango, Kevin Rice, Kyle Barrett, Matt Cutler, Matt Ross, Mike Burnett, Nathan Elliott, Neil Brennan, Nick Sergi, Robert Cummins, Russell Elledge, 
Samuel Custer, Grim Santo, Sean Spinobi, Tark Latif, Fall 13 Hero, and Willie Yates. Thank you very much for supporting the show. It means the world to us. So let's go to patron thoughts. If you're a patron, you can leave your thoughts about upcoming episodes and we read them. Our first comment comes from, control F, where are we? Alex Bogut says, The Siege of AR-558, the quintessential war story. For me, this was the episode that truly brought home the fact that war is hell rather than CGI ships firing at one another. Along with the Pale Moonlight, a growing up episode for Star Trek. Sam Luca Wessel says, Ground camp combat is always kind of off-brand in Trek, but this one does a better job than most of uh, than most of integrating the high technology with the blood and the sweat. Matt Ross says, Welcome to In Country, Start Fleet, Vietnam, Hamburger Hill, and Zulu Dawn all combined. If the last episode had the old soldier cliche, this says every war cliche except for the guy pining for his mom's spaghetti in Brooklyn. That said, I still find it a nice view of what the Starfleet people look like at war. Quark's line about how humans are just a veneer of civilization is up there with the root beer quote. Otherwise, I actually like it more than the root beer quote, but anyway. Uh, otherwise, we got Vargas, the PTSD guy, Reese, the stone cold killer collecting tubes, and the sharp knife. Kellen, the sort of able engineer, Bill Mummy, both of the Twilight Zone and B5. Luckily, Esri has all the knowledge in her USB drive to assist. The mines were an intriguing and totally barbaric weapon that no one would expect of the Jem'Hadar. Nog losing a limb a bit of surprise, but not a surprise of Quark shooting. Now, if we could just get rid of Rom singing, considering Grunchek can actually sing, and Vic Fontaine bit, it would be a stellar, and the Vic Fontaine bit, it would be a stellar episode. That scene felt extremely tacked on. I still enjoy it and even watch it when the mood for cliche wars and consider it one of the best of ZS9. I always wondered, what if Fontaine was a Metallica program or Elton John? What music would you play at the end? Uh, we didn't Probably talk about the mind. Metallica mines. or Elton John. <laughs> <laughs> your war war is hell uh we didn't talk about the mines at all and matt brought them up um first of all i would like to say i don't i would not lump this in with cliche war stuff because first of all hamburger hill is a terrible movie and has <laughs> all of the things that i said about that do work about this do not work in that because okay. that movie is like a bunch of people sitting around in vietnam costumes saying terrible dialogue i've never seen it so i can't comment it's, i'll take it's your terrible word. dave D- dave will deny this up and down well he also likes but, dune so yeah <laughs> dave will deny dave will deny this up and down but me and jim remember very clearly him talking about how good of a movie hamburger hill was mm. and neither of us had seen it so one year when we did our uh, 24-hour movie marathon we watched hamburger hill and it was so fucking bad <laughs> And then we called him on it afterwards, and he's like, I've never said that. I've never seen that movie. And I was like, oh, you son of a bitch. Cover your tracks. Cover your tracks. Uh, the Mines. What did you think about The Mines? Uh, I, thought they were f- I thought they were fine. Um, I like the, the, the scene of their reveal is really yeah. cool, I think. Um, outside the, of that, I think that they are just a script necessity that sure. has to happen. Yeah. Yeah, they're they're um I actually hadn't thought about using them to blow as a weapon against them. Um like it did, I I wasn't totally tracking what the deal with the mines was cuz I didn't exactly get how they were there but you couldn't see them and sometimes they didn't blow up. Yeah, they're in subspace. They're just totally random yeah. just to make it all the more stressful while you're back there. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that is pretty fucking stressful. I, 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 I it almost feels like it's too heavy-handed of a war cliche. It's like anything yeah. could happen at any time. These mines well, are invisible. Well, it's also it's also it's not like there was like 5 of them. Right. You know, it, it, it was like there was there's third, there was like yeah. 30 to 40 of them in a very tight space. <laughs> so they could have just set them all off at once and killed everybody there. Yes. Yeah. Um but yeah, I, I it hadn't occurred to me that they were going to use those as the as a way to take everybody out. I had I knew something like that was going to happen. Um, but yeah, I thought they were fine. I thought yeah, the scene where they all show up was kind of cool. Uh, where it shows up right next to Tuco's head. Was yeah, good. it turns around slowly to look at it. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I did like the line. It may be the most heavy handed line in the episode where uh, one I I don't know if it's necklace guy or whoever it was was like. I, weren't we just weren't we just talking shit about these things? Now we're going to use them as a, a to to kill for our side or something. Oh, like that. Dex says that. De- Dex, oh, it's Dex. Yeah, okay. Dex says that. Like, I can't believe we're going to use these weapons that we were just bitching about to kill our enemies. Yeah, 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 yeah. That was that was good, if a little heavy handed, but you know, I thought it worked. It is. It's it's heavy handed because her um, Bashir's line was right before or Bashir's line. Probably after that. Bashir's line after that is better and more subtle about, like, this isn't what I signed up to Starfleet to do. It's just right. the, the compromises that they're all making uh, are are better brought to light by Bashir than Dax. 
David Beardmore says, definitely one of the core DS9 episodes that distinguishes it from other series. They did a really good job of showing a realistic way that fighting would take place in the future. Quirk's scene where he talks with Nog about humans really brings the Roddenberry-esque trek back down to Earth. Bonus, I love seeing a young Tuco from Breaking Bad as a battle-hardened Vietnam soldier. Don't we all? Neil Brennan, it's right around now that the constraints of 1990s network TV start to constrain the show. Nowadays, Nog would have died. Still, a fine episode. Cool of Cisco to lecture Kira, a seasoned freedom fighter, on the nature of death and war at the end. Yeah. I might have stole I might have stole Neil's point there, but yeah, it is definitely. I think I noticed it while I was watching the the episode. But it's yeah, it is a. Um, I, I think the the weirdest thing about her is her reaction, where she she doesn't really give him the like, yeah, I know kind of look. Mm-hmm. She 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 absorbs it. I think on a. Uh, I'm glad actually that she's not in this episode because mm. I feel like that would have been too much to have her who does have that point of view because you know you're gonna have to have a scene where she talks about it she, yeah and this I don't isn't think as bad that. as the bajoran occupation five months try 50 years mother yeah, yeah exactly yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> i think i think in season two or three they probably do that but i think it's a different episode altogether then so i um one startling and this is kind of related to this just because we have an odo scene and a kira scene where they're where they're by their self by themselves even though they're not major characters in this episode I, I see a strong. I'm having because of this rewatch a strong mental break between. I I think that post and pre Kira and Odo is like mm-hmm. the BC AD of the calendar years. It's like a <laughs> because they th- those characters don't really have scenes like they used to yeah. with other characters. Yeah. Like it, it feels really of a different time in the show where Cisco and Odo talk to each other. And right. it was it stuck out as so odd that they talk to each other here because it doesn't happen all that often. And I think it's really to the detriment of the show that they can't count on those characters. They can, but they choose not to write those characters having individual scenes and bouncing things off of each other because it, it limits the cast, I think, in a lot of ways. So I'm glad to see it here for what it was. And it's very strange that they have completely disappeared as though, you know, I like we've said before, it's not like their star-crossed love was the point of the show or the point of those characters for six seasons. And now that they're together, it's like, well, what else do you do with them? Right. It feels like, it they're, feels still like they're pretty, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they're pretty well-established characters where this relationship should be kind of like a, a background element. Yeah, back, the, the relationship should be backgrounded to what they're going through, specifically Odo, because I think Odo is very important to what's going on here. But yeah, it's, it's the same for both of them. Very strange. Agree. Christian Pouch says, The single best portrayal of ground combat in Star Trek, while you could nitpick the world to death, why are there no fixed gun emplacements, armored vehicles, etc.? The episode sells the grittiness of war and how, even with all the technology you have at your disposal, it comes down to a lot of ugly, close-in fighting. Quark is used excellently as he brings a viewpoint that is simultaneously, simultaneously naive and insightful. The supporting Starfleet troops, while not having deep character explorations, do a lot with very little screen time. Nog represents well the countless young, eager men and women who go to war trying to do their job and paying a high price for it. More than the acting, the choreography and cinematography are great. The fighting is fast, intense, brutal, and well shot. Trek fight scenes tend to be awkward, and this is not. Music was great, too. Side note, in case you were wondering, this takes place on one of the several planets in the Chintaka system, which was taken by the Federation in Season 6's finale. Oh. So there is a uh, so they are holding the planet that they just recently took uh, is the the other way to say that. Uh, Dwayne Hackett, another winner for the season. I love episodes that show the horrors of war in a Star Trek universe. Up until now, it was a largely CGI battles and one-off episode conflicts, but this episode sticks with you. I was even excited to see Bill Mummy in this episode, furthering the reconciliation between Star Trek and Babylon Five. Even though he does die in this episode, so that may not have been stating much. The episode was well-crafted for the resources they had and clearly a budget saver for some of the more costly episodes that have yet to come. Some criticisms. I do think the episode should have stuck more with Quark being the only civilian in the group. Having his full perspective may have resonated more. Additionally, I would have loved to see more ground tactics being used by the Jem'Hadar. Also, I feel that the Jem'Hadar should have been more imposing. (laughs) They seem weaker in the episode by comparison. All in all, a great episode featuring interesting use of tech resulting in a lot of death for glorified e- for a glorified email server. Two things that continue to bother me, though. The size of the force holding the planet and how do they move the Houdinis and seeing them as one thing and moving them as another. Don't think too hard about it. Four out of five. Yeah. I, the the Jem Hadar's uh, ground attack strategy seems limited to either uh, walking quietly or running loudly. Yep. Yep. 
Although it's tough. I I think if you dedicate too much time to their tactics, um, yeah, you yeah. lose something it, there. Like yeah, they gotta, are just supposed to be the going. zombie force that you can't stop. Right. Yeah. right. Uh, because you know, for as much as they're talked up, uh, Starfleet tends to have an easy time killing Jim Hadar. You know, for all of their <laughs> reputation as uh, brutal killing warriors, they're they're fairly easy to kill. They don't seem that difficult. It's like I've always said: when you introduce a super un- unkillable thing, and then eventually you add more of them, uh, it has to be. Uh, they can't. They have to either either be. Uh, there has to either be more of them, or they have to be smarter. But they can't be both because that's too hard. Right. That's like the, uh, did you ever play Halo, the video game? No, no. Well, Halo starts off with the, you are fighting, uh, aliens that are like your equals, kind of like they have the same ability mm-hmm. as you. So it's kind of like yeah. that. But then halfway through the game, you meet a new alien named the flood, which are super easy to kill, but there's just like billions of them coming at mm-hmm. you. So it, it is kind of that thing. It's like the, the flood just charge at you, but they don't have human tactics, but there's just a lot of them on screen. So it's harder to kill, but you, you certainly can't combine both because that would be the ultimate enemy that you'd have to deal with. Right. Samuel S. says, best depiction of combat in Star Trek that has ever been done. Episode reminded me of Rogue One a little bit. A small group of soldiers going up against a massive amount of adversity in order to achieve a goal that is seemingly impossible. I liked it a lot, but I don't love it, and I can't put my finger on why. I think it just doesn't feel very trekky, and I have a hard time buying that all of the main characters would survive. Four out of five. Cal Barrett with the last comment. I love that this episode begins with a trick opening, making you think that it'll be about Rom acting like an absolute plank for 45 minutes, <laughs> only for it to turn into one of the darkest and grittiest episodes of Star Trek. That uh, plank joke is a Discord joke for everyone uh, who's wondering, so join the Discord channel. Everything works perfectly in the episode, and while Quark tagging along is a little contrived, I love his scenes when he gets to comment on the Federation. Those soldiers sure do look like they need a root beer. The music is great, both the score and the scene in which everyone is waiting for the Jem'Hadar to attack, but nothing but the sound of Vic Fontaine and some space cicadas acting as the soundtrack. That's one of my all-time favorite Star Trek scenes. I wonder if the episode should have ended with a scene between Sisko and Jake, considering the cautionary tale and what happens with Nog, but even without it, this episode is one of DS9's finest. I, I feel like if this if this was a show, a popular show that was happening now, you would have... Uh, a bunch of internet edits with different songs over that last scene. Yes, yeah. Like, could you imagine, like, Bashir coming out with a smile on his face and it's just like The Stroke by Billy Squire is blasting and they're like, what's that? And he's like, it's just something I thought everyone needed to hear right now. Yeah, just, just like Sir Mix-a-Lot, uh, Baby Got Back or something. <laughs> it's a cornerstone of, of culture. Thank you very much, patrons, for leaving your thoughts about the episode. It's I, a good one. I did, I did, I do like uh Kyle n- n- uh mentioning that it, it does it is a head fake where it's like you thought this episode was going to be terrible. How many people turned it off? <laughs> yeah, just like I don't need to watch this. I got other things to not, do. That not only do they give you Rom auditioning for Vic Fontaine, but then they give you the second punch of uh potentially the Grand Negus showing up. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> they wanted all the true uh, the uh the non not true fans to just abandon this. This is for the this is for the real people who stick with the show. Uh, thank you, patrons. Thank you very much for supporting the show and leaving your comments. Clay, what are you going to give Siege of AR558 on our scale of 1 to 5? Mm. Do, do I, I think I... I don't know if I... What are you going to give it? I'm going to give it a 5 because yeah. I think this is a really affecting episode that... um. Uh, uh, I I personally think it gets a little bit dusty with the with the Cisco and Worf scene at the end. I think that they, mm-hmm. I think it's a nice little scene that just sums up everything. Worf isn't overbearing about it, but you just get the sense of. I think it's the episode that really captures the Dominion War in the way that they want the show to do it. I think, and if someone were to say, "Show me one episode about the Dominion War," I think you would show this one, or I would show it, just because it. Even if you're unfamiliar with how long it's been and how many episodes have focused on it, I think that this is this captures what the show is trying to say about the war, I think, in the most effective way. Yeah. I am I I feel hard pressed not to give it a five. If it's not a five, it's a really high four. Um Hmm. What didn't you what I guess what didn't you like about it that would knock it down from a five for I, you? I I guess it's just that it 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 took longer to get me there than I thought it would, mm-hmm. or th- than it usually does for the fives. You know, it fe- the fives for me, I feel like by the end of the uh, 
of the cold open, you're kind of in it already. Yeah. Um, this one they do the Vic Fontaine thing, and then they've got the quark on the blah blah blah. So I on in, on second watch, I probably would would give it a higher mark. Ugh. Hmm, interesting. Yeah, fine. I'll give it a five. Give it a five as well. I would. Um, I guess the other. I don't have the list in front of me, but I think if I was like looking at a top ten list for DS Nine for me, I'm pretty mm-hmm. sure this is a top ten episode. I think. Yeah, this is definitely an episode I would probably tell people to watch. Yeah, um, it's vital to the. If you do uh, another thing, to, it's if you're doing a curated list, would you watch this episode? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. It's it's really interesting if you compare some of these episodes, the must watch episodes to TNG must watch episodes. Cause if you go down the list, the TNG must watch episodes are usually fairly high concept mm-hmm. uh, because of the episodic nature of the show. It's like, Oh yeah, this is the one where the ship keeps blowing up or, Oh, this is the one where Tasha Yar falls in love with uh shooter McGavin. Right. <laughs> this one's Enterprise like, this is the up. one where the, uh, the crew's trapped on a plant with Jen, Jem Hadar. You go, wait a minute. Is that uh which of the 17 episodes is, yeah. is that in TS9? Yeah. Yeah, this this one it's like the crew's trapped on a planet, and they wait. Yes, Jem Hadar are there. Quark is there talking about humans. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes, uh, this doesn't this doesn't sound super good. No, trust me, it's great. No, it's uh, it's a lot subtler of a of a great episode than I think traditionally a fives are. I think. Yeah, yeah, I I hundred percent agree. To me, making a best of TNG list is kind of, like if I have the list, it's very easy for me to go through and make that list to be like these are these are my ten favorite episodes. DS9 is a little bit trickier for me, even down to the point of I sometimes don't remember what the episode is titled that they that mm-hmm. they kind of do. Uh, like, that, I lose track of them that way. I think that TNG's high-concept stuff works better for episode titles because you remember it more easily. But, yeah, it's, um, it's tough. Uh, it, it is just the nature of how DS9 tells its stories that it's, it's... I think I said this at the start of our DS9 coverage. DS9's highs are lower than TNG's, I think in a lot of ways, like on an episode by episode basis. But I think that they, they're more consistent within themselves. Like the, the best of DS nine are all kind of the same uh, thing in a, in a positive way, not a negative way. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Let's see. I think that's it. Thank you, patrons. So we're both going to give it fives. I'll write it down. It's our first five of season seven for both of us. So that's a, something to celebrate. I really like the episode. I think clay does too. Um, But I guess that's it. Thank you for supporting the show. Thank you for listening. You can check out patreon.com slash the Penske file if you want to support us financially. It's much appreciated. Otherwise, Facebook, Twitter, Discord is all down below. If you want to get the inside jokes like what a plank is, go to Discord and fill yourself in. Clay, anything you want to say? Um, No. No, I don't think I got anything to plug. So We have... Uh, we're going to try to do a Halloween special for Real Ripe and Real Rotten, so we'll work on that. Hopefully that comes out. Badass will come back next week. Uh, or this week, I think, when this episode comes out. So you can look forward to that. Although I'm putting, uh, I might be putting pressure on Clay with that one. I don't know. I haven't talked about it. I'm just assuming. Uh, but Badass will be back when it's back. Real Ripe will be back with some Halloween stuff. And then uh, our Black Mirror coverage should wrap up this month as well. So on Patreon. Thank you very much, guys, for listening. Thank you for supporting the show. We'll see you later. 